Good evening and welcome to Porter Square Books. Our special guest tonight is Ted Carasotti, author of the new book, Pucka's Promise, The Quest for Longer Lived Dogs. Born in New York and raised in Bayville, Long Island, Ted Carasotti's writing and photographs have appeared in dozens of publications, including the New York Times, Outside, Field and Stream, Salon.com, Audubon, and the National Geographic Traveler. He's the author of many books, including Pucka, The Pup After Merle, Blood Ties, Nature, Culture, and the Hunt, Heart of Home, People, Wildlife, Place, Return of the Wild, The Future of Our National Lands, and one of the most definitive works on the ethics of hunting out there, In the Wild, in a Wild Age, which won the National Outdoor Book Award, and of course, the beloved, best-selling, and deeply moving Merle's Door, Lessons from a Free-Thinking Dog. Please wel welcome a great friend to this bookstore, Ted Carasotti. We're just going to see a few images from Merle and Pucka's life to start the show off.
Thank you so much for coming out this evening and listening to me talk about Pucka's promise, which is really the promise of all our dogs to lead healthier, longer lives if we but changed how we bred and cared for them. It's wonderful to see so many old friends and family in the audience, and I really appreciate your coming out in the face of approaching Nemo when you should be at the grocery stores shopping for food to get you through the long weekend. It's also great to be back here at Porter Square Books, one of the really wonderful, fine, independent bookstores in the land, where I closed down Pucka's Puppy Book Tour just three years ago, standing right here, and have read from Merle's door. And it's also just a delight to be back in Boston, one of my favorite cities, where I can smell the salt, dampy, damp air that we don't get in Wyoming, and I can eat all the seafood that we don't have back there in the hinterlands. In fact, I was over with some friends at the Union Oyster House this afternoon, and I could hardly decide between the steamers and the oysters and the clams and the fresh caught fish. Mm -mm -mm, as I would say to Paka. <laughs> but I didn't come here this evening to talk to you about all my unrequited seafood lust. I came to talk about the new book. It's a book that was inspired by you, the readers of Merle's Door. And I can remember the exact moment when I realized that I would write it. I was sitting in my hotel room in Monroe, Louisiana, there in the Deep South, one rainy October afternoon in 2007 while on Merle's book tour. And I had a few hours ahead of me before my presentation that evening at the local bookstore. I was sitting at my laptop reading my email and I was once again struck by a common refrain. Why, as so many of you asked, did my dog die at two years old, at three, at four, at five? Why is my dog going blind from progressive retinal atrophy? Why did my dog become arthritic after being vaccinated? Why, as one of you wrote, have four out of my five golden retrievers died of cancer? Mm -hmm. Four out of five. Well, I had gotten hundreds of these kinds of questions in the several months since I had published Merle. And I sat back in my chair and I thought, gosh, why do our dogs die so young? Why had Brower, Merle's best friend and a golden retriever, developed a malignant cancer on his snout when he was only six years old? Why had Pearlie, another of Merle's good friends and a black lab, developed a fatal neurofibrosarcoma on her spine when she was seven. Why did Merle, no young dog at 14, nonetheless succumb to his brain tumor when some of my horses are still going strong at 25 years old today? Why, I have to ask myself, has nature decreed that our friendly, good-natured dogs, our best friends in the animal kingdom, are already ancient in their teens while giving the tortoise, the unhuggable tortoise, more than a century of life and some whales 200 years to swim through the polar seas. Curious to find an answer to that question, I began to Google around that afternoon on the internet and soon discovered that dogs don't live as long as some other animals do because they're the direct descendants of wolves, sharing 99.9% .9 of their DNA, and wolves themselves are a short-lived species. Our dogs have inherited this fateful genetic legacy, but how we then breed and care for them can shorten further their naturally brief lives. Almost everyone I read that afternoon agreed that four factors could conspire to shorten the lives of our dogs. And these are careless inbreeding, 
over vaccination, poor nutrition, and exposure to environmental pollutants. I sat back in my chair, I was staring at my laptop at all the window applications that I had seen, and I was suddenly struck by this supernova flash of inspiration that occasionally, very occasionally, bless a writer during his career, during which he sees the entirety of his new work before him in a flash of white light. And if he could only type fast enough, he'd get it all down in two or three seconds. Well, it took me five years to research and write the book. But what I saw in those few seconds was a book with three aims. The first would be that by exploring and describing these four factors, I might give dogs and their people a bit more time, a few more years together. Second, I could uh, let my heart continue to heal from Merle's death while I was doing this research. <clears throat> Excuse me. And third, I could use what I was learning to help me find a dog who might live longer than Merle had. I could then describe the pitfalls and triumphs of raising this new dog according to Merle's free thinking principles, interweaving this cutting edge science with a good dog story and a good human story. Whether I've succeeded in that end, <clears throat> you the readers will decide. Little did I know when I began my research that I was going to have to cover three more issues in order to make the book truly comprehensive. These were the effects of spaying and neutering on the health of our dogs, how the North American shelter system might be transformed so it doesn't kill 1.5 million healthy dogs and 2.5 million healthy cats each year, and third, how or rather the role that freedom plays, giving dogs more off-leash time and allowing them to make more of their own choices, the role that that sort of freedom plays in both the physical and mental health of our dogs. The five years that I spent researching and writing Puckett's Promise was one of truly the great adventures of my life. And I've been on a lot of great adventures. But this was truly wonderful, fun-filled, joyous. I went all over the world, and I met some extraordinary people in the veterinary, dog breeding, and animal welfare movements without whose help I simply could not have written this book. They were my mentors, they were my teachers, and I will be forever indebted to them. I hope that you will join us on the journey we took by reading Pucka's Promise, but if you don't have time to read the book, after all, it's fairly fat, or if you want to wait till the paperback comes out, <laughs> people are smiling, what can I tell you this evening in the next 30 minutes to help you give you a roadmap to increase the health and longevity of your dog. The cliff notes, if you will, of Pucka's Promise. So here you go, the cliff notes for Pucka's Promise. To start, I would hope that if you're in the market for a new dog, that you would carefully consider its origins. If you go to a shelter, it's more than likely that you're gonna get a mixed breed dog because mixed breeds make up most of our shelter population. And in one way, that's good news, because if you look at the veterinary literature, it shows that mixed breed dogs have the potential to live 1.8 years longer than a purebred of equivalent weight, and they suffer from fewer genetically transmitted diseases. However, the likelihood is high that you're going to know nothing about the ancestry of that dog. What its parents and grandparents and great-grandparents died of and how long they lived. On the other hand, if you go to a reputable breeder, you can trace the pedigree of your prospective litter back through time and call up the breeders 
of the grandparents and great-grandparents and say, hey, Max, how long did Flasher live? And how, what did Sally pass away from? I did this with Pucka. I traced his ancestry back 30 generations to 1868 to a dog, one of the first recorded Labrador retrievers named Netherby Boson, <laughs> who was born on the estate of the 11th Earl of Home in Scotland. And I couldn't call up the 11th Earl of Home or his descendants, but I was able to call up breeders in the latter part of the 20th century and the early 2000s and say, you know, what did Pucka's great-grandfather and great-grandmother die of and how long did they live? This is a very useful thing because it gives you an idea of how what the average longevity is of the line you're buying into. Plus, you can ask the breeder if he or she has given the dam and sire of your prospective litter all the orthopedic health screenings, for example, for hip dysplasia or elbow dysplasia, and all the pertinent DNA tests. So you're hedging your bets about getting a biomechanically sound puppy that isn't going to die pretty soon of an easily preventable genetically tr transmitted disease like progressive retinal atrophy that makes dogs go blind. Very easy disease to prevent. You just don't make two dogs who have the recessive gene for that. Okay, so you've gotten a new dog that you think is genetically healthy, or maybe you already have a dog, I would advise you to try to minimally vaccinate it and ignore the advice of any veterinarian who says you need to give this dog all its vaccines every single year. Vaccines are not benign for all the good they do, and they can cause adverse reactions, everything from welts to arthritis to fatal hemolytic anemia. And we now know that the duration of immunity for the four core canine vaccines, parvovirus, distemper, adenovirus 2, and rabies, is far longer than any of us previously imagined. In fact, the duration of immunity for these four vaccines is 7 to 15 years, depending on the strain. Consequently, the American Animal Hospital Association's Vaccine Task Force now recommends that dogs are not vaccinated any more frequently with the four core canine vaccines than every three years. Every three years. However, there are some veterinarians and immunologists who take this protocol one step further. One of them is the renowned immunologist, Dr. Ronald Schultz. I see people nodding their heads. Probably some of you have read his work. He lives and works in the University of Miss Madison, Wisconsin. And his recommendation is instead of vaccinating a dog every three years, you ask your veterinarian to take a blood sample and you titer it. The titer measures the antibodies that the dog has against the diseases for which it's been vaccinated. If the dog has immunity, no need to revaccinate it. It's protected. If it has lost its immunity, then you give it a booster shot. Well, you can use the very same protocol with a new puppy. When it's about 16 to 18 weeks old, you give it the three core vaccines, parvo, distemper, adenovirus 2, spread out about a week apart so you don't overtax its immune system, and then several weeks later, you titer it to see if it's developed immunity. If it has, no need to vaccinate it further. If it hasn't, you give it a booster shot. Of course, the rabies shot is different. It should be given at about four months old, and you should also titer to see if it's the puppy has developed immunity. But the rabies shot has to be given every three years, come what may, legally in this country. Of course, you can ignore that recommendation if you wish. And in some municipalities, the rabies vaccine is required every year, which is total overkill. 
Dr. Schultz and Dr. Jean Dodds, another veterinarian and immunologist from Santa Monica, whose work some of you may know, are currently conducting the Rabies Challenge Study at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. They're trying to prove that the duration of the rabies vaccine is in fact seven years long, as Dr. Schultz's own title work and French data have shown. They need to prove this to the USDA, which is the licensing agency for canine vaccines. And if they do, and the results will be out by 2014, we won't have to vaccinate our dogs against rabies anymore, except every seven years, which will be a very good thing since the rabies vaccine causes more adverse reactions than all the others. So we now have this dog who's minimally vaccinated, genetically healthy, and we'd like to feed it well. Let's begin our discussion on nutrition by saying that no one has yet done a good scientific study comparing genetically similar dogs say litter mates, and you feed one group a grain-free diet and one group a diet based in corn or rice, and watch these dogs for their entire lifetimes, 12, 15, 20 years, until the last one has died. And then you figure out when each dog got chronic diseases and how long they lived. And then we could say, yes, diet A is better than diet B. Since no one has done such a study, no one can categorically say one diet is better for dogs than another. But the absence of such study shouldn't prevent us from making an informed decision about how to feed our dogs. And the reason we can make an informed decision because lots of other good science has been done on the canid diet. One really important study shows that when you feed healthy dogs starch like rice or corn, their blood glucose and insulin levels spike. Numerous other studies have shown that keeping blood glucose and insulin levels at a low range of normal is associated with fewer chronic diseases like diabetes and obesity, and longer lifespan in species as diverse as worms, fish, monkeys, dogs, and humans. Still another group of studies shows that if you eat green leafy and yellow orange vegetables, you have some protection against certain cancers. And this data is true for both humans and dogs. And still a fourth group of studies shows that if you switch dogs from a high carb diet to a high protein one, their performance improves. They're aerobically fitter, they have a higher VO2 max, more endurance, and they have better thermal regulation. They pant less, they drink less in hot weather. So taking all this information, what might a cautious person do who wanted their dog to live as long as possible? The cautious person might say, well, I'm going to feed my dog a low grain or no grain diet supplemented with green leafy and orange yellow vegetables and a good source of high quality protein. And in fact, pet food manufacturers have looked at this data and they now offer a bunch of dog foods that meet these criteria. They offer kibbles, they offer dry raw food, and frozen raw food. So if one wants to feed their dog this way, one can do it pretty easily. This food is available at pet stores and online. Okay, we're now got this dog, it's well fed, minimally vaccinated, genetically healthy. It's time to address its exposure to environmental pollutants. All those carcinogens, neurotoxins, and endocrine disruptors that make up this vast chemical ocean outside and in here, through which all of us swim every single day. Unfortunately, our dog's exposure to these toxins is greater than ours because like children, they're smaller and their exposure per unit of body weight is greater. Moreover, dogs 
take in the world through their nose. That's their major sense. So they've got their nose out there in the herbicide treated grass on the pavement. They're breathing it in. They walk around bear pod and then they come home at night and they don't take a shower. They lick their fur and they lick their paws further ingesting these toxic chemicals. Well, there are a few simple things that you can do to reduce your dog's exposure to these toxic chemicals. And the first would be not to feed it corn. Corn is the most heavily sprayed agricultural crop in the United States. It receives 30% of the pesticide application in the USA. Also, these days, 85% of the corn crop is genetically modified. That means that it's repeatedly sprayed with the herbicide Roundup. So there's a good nutritional reason not to feed your dog corn, and there's also a good toxicological reason not to feed it corn. So, another way that you can reduce your dog's exposure to environmental chemicals is also simple. Just replace its plastic bowls with stainless steel or glass ones. The plastic may contain endocrine disrupting phthalates. You can give your dog a bed that doesn't contain fire retardant fillers, which also have endocrine disruptors in them. You can look carefully at your new carpets or your old carpets and make sure they're not finished with formaldehyde, a known carcinogen. The dog is lying on the carpet, the formaldehyde in a new carpet takes a year or two to off gas. All that time, the dog is breathing in formaldehyde. Another good step to take is to put a water filtration device on your tap. It'll take out nitrates, chlorine, heavy metals. Good for you, good for your dog, and your coffee, tea, and water will taste better. Last, you could not use herbicides and pesticides on your trees and on your lawn, and you can give your dogs non-toxic dog toys. One of the major ways that dogs ingest pollutants is through their dog toys. I did a bunch of dog, of testing of dog toys. You can read about it in the book. Pucka's retriever dummies contain a phthalate that's prohibited in children's toys. The polyester in one of his stuffed hedgehogs had 10,000 times the antimony, a suspected carcinogen that the WHO allows in human drinking water. So look for non-toxic dog toys. All right, we now have this dog around whom we've tried to put up some dikes to keep out environmental pollutants. It's well-fed, minimally vaccinated, genetically healthy. It's about six months old, and almost certainly your veterinarian is going to say, time to spay or neuter this dog. This is a decision you ought to think about really carefully. Because in the last decade or so, there's been emerging evidence in the veterinary literature that spayed or neutered dogs suffer more adverse reactions to vaccines than do intact ones. In general, spayed and neutered dogs are also more obese. They have more endocrine dysfunction, like thyroid and adrenal disease. They have more urinary incontinence. They have more ACL injuries, a tear of the anterior cruciate ligament in the knee. Most worrisome in this research is that that shows that spayed or neutered dogs have higher incidences of certain cancers the risk of a spayed or neutered dog developing osteosarcoma, bone cancer, is twice that of an intact dog. They have two to four times the risk of developing bladder cancer, and a spayed female has five times the risk of developing hemangiosarcoma, a cancer of the blood vessels. There are safer and less invasive procedures to give your dog than a spay or a neuter in order for it not to have puppy, puppies. You could give a female dog a tubal ligation or a hysterectomy. You can give a male dog a vasectomy. These are the very same procedures that are used in human medicine, and their reproductive result is exactly the same as spaying or neutering, no puppies. 
However, because a vasectomy, a tubal ligation, or a hysterectomy leave the ovaries and testes within the dog, spaying and neutering, take out both, the dog gets to retain its beneficial sex hormones, estrogen and testosterone, which have been shown to forestall or prevent all of those nasty conditions that I just mentioned. Many veterinarians will counter this sort of information by saying, oh, well, that's fine and good, but none of those procedures give you spaying's chief virtue. And they are correct. The chief virtue of spaying is that if you spay a female dog before her first heat, she has virtually zero chance of ever developing mammary cancer. Mammary cancer is the same cancer in dogs that we call breast cancer in human beings. However, what then is not added, and which is very important to consider, is that the risk of a female dog developing mammary cancer is dependent on her breed. For example, golden retrievers are ranked number 35 in a study that looked at the incidence of mammary cancer in 51 breeds. Should we then spay this golden retriever to protect her from one cancer, mammary cancer, for which she has an inherently medium to low risk, only to increase her risk to hemangiosarcoma by 500% and increase her risk to other cancers as well? This isn't merely a theoretical question because hemangiosarcoma is the leading killer of golden retrievers in this country. In fact, 61.4% of golden retrievers die of cancer in North America. I filled the spay neuter chapter of the new book with this kind of detailed information in the hope that it would give you a way to make a more nuanced decision about whether to spay or neuter your dog, give it an alternative form of birth control, and there are now chemicals as well that can be implanted or injected that give six months to two and a half months of infertility. Give it, what? The pill. Well, they don't take the pill, they get it injected or there's a, an implantation, but yes, kind of like the pill. Or, the third choice to deal with a dog's reproductive capacity is to actually leave it intact. And this suggestion has become highly controversial in North America because over the last four decades, the animal welfare community has done such a powerful job to convince all of us to spay or neuter every single one of our dogs. However, once again, an important piece of information has been left out during these campaigns, and it's an important piece of information about the biology of female domestic dogs. They come into heat only twice a year, for about two weeks each time, 10 days, two weeks, maybe a little more. That's the only time of the year they can get pregnant. So if you keep them on a leash, or you keep them in, a, in the house, or in the barn, or in the kennel, they cannot get pregnant, nor can they get pregnant all the rest of the 48 weeks of the year, even if they're a free-roaming dog and consorting with intact male dogs. They can't. <laughs> this is the strategy, sequestering female dogs during their twice yearly estrus period that Western Europeans have used to reduce the number of unwanted canine pregnancies. And as a result, very, very few healthy dogs are killed in the shelters of Western Europe, even though most Western Europeans, unlike North Americans, keep their dogs intact. This may be one of the reasons that some breeds, like the Golden Retriever, live a year longer in the United Kingdom than they do in the United States. Those UK Goldens, still have their estrogen and testosterone, and ours do not. 
I would submit to you that this kind of strategy, controlling female dogs during their estrus period, should be part of a multi-tiered approach to transforming the North American shelter system into a no-kill one. And other facets of that strategy would be keeping the shelter open at night and on weekends so working people can visit and adopt a dog, doing off-site adoptions at malls like this or Petco or PetSmart, and having a cadre of volunteers who can take care of young puppies and young kittens before they can go to their new home because they're too young. And I think it should also include giving people, adopters, the choice to spay or neuter their dog or give it an alternative form of birth control like a tubal ligation, hysterectomy, or vasectomy. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm really dry tonight. The last issue that I touched upon in the new book is that of freedom. And over the last few years, numerous studies have been published, I'm sure some of you have read them, that show that having autonomy, the ability to make our own decisions at least some of the time, is associated with a longer lifespan, whether you're a baboon, a zebra, a canid, or a human being. I think we need to give our dogs more of that kind of autonomy. and. To begin doing so, I think we need to reimagine the concept of dog training. Instead of merely working with our dogs so that they reliably repeat the behaviors we want them to do, I think we should have an ongoing conversation with them. And in this ongoing conversation, we would pay more attention to what they're telling us about the freedoms they most desire. And these freedoms are multifarious and they would vary with the dog, but certainly a few of them would be the chance to sleep where they want at night, maybe not on the human couch, but maybe on the dedicated quadruped couch like Merle and Pucka have. Uh, the chance to have more than one dog food for their entire lives, you know, to rotate their food so they get a variety of tastes and have uh, an eclectic source of the nutrients they need. A really important freedom would be to run at dog speed with other dogs off leash in green places at least a few times a week, preferably more. And certainly another freedom that has occurred to me as I walk Pucka on the trails around Jackson is not to have their worried people constantly commanding and chivying them every five seconds, overcome Bella heel, when all they're trying to do is have a little chat with their canine friends or smell their pee mail. Uh, the dogs will eventually come along. It may take 15 seconds, it may take two minutes, we could be a little bit more patient with them because they do come along. Um, some dogs don't, but most dogs do. After all, we love them, we feed them, they love us, and they know where their kibble is poured. <laughs> when it is not an emergency, and when you're not in the midst of a training session, why not give the dog a little bit more space to make its own choice about how it's going to spend its time? After all, that's what we try to do for our best friends. In this vein, and in closing, I'd like to read just a few sections from the new book that describe how I've tried to have that ongoing conversation with Pucka. They're from a chapter called In the Time of the Big Light. And I guess I'll need a book. And for all of those with presbyopia, as I have, there is a large print edition coming out. <laughs> During Pucka's first summer, we spent most of our days outside, the dawn coming early, four in the morning, the dusk sifting into darkness at nearly 11, not arctic by any means, but a good long run of day. Often we played 
toss and fetch near the aspen tree under which Merle had spent his last weeks. And one evening, as we were lying on the grass after our game, the sky darkened over the sleeping Indian, the mountain above Kelly, and a thunderhead began to tower. I hoped it would boom and give me the opportunity to thunderproof Pucka at this young and impressionable age. Snuggling against my side, he dozed, and soon turned onto his back so I could rub his belly. Just then, the ominous sky let out a shattering crash. He flipped over. Wide-eyed, he stared at the great black roiling cloud. Thunder, I said in a happy voice. Oh, so very exciting, I stroked his shoulders. The thunder crashed again. See, thunder, I said enticingly, pointing upward. Big boom, what fun! He stared at the dark clouds and thwacked his tail on the grass. Thunder, what fun! He wiggled against my side, his tail swishing happily while the sky crashed and the lightning flashed above us. My lesson worked better than I could have possibly imagined. On the 4th of July, we walked to the base of Snow King Mountain where fireworks are shot into the sky above the town of Jackson. I knew of no dogs who liked fireworks, and I was ready to comfort Pucka and take him speedily away. But he sat down, his jaw hanging open in wonder, as he stared at the red, white, and blue starbursts crashing over our heads. A great wave of white rockets rushed upward, and he leapt into the air as if to chase them, laughing jubilantly, more, 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 his tail beating faster and faster, and finally vanishing in a blur as the fireworks reached their monumental crescendo, ear-shattering detonations echoing from the mountainside. Then, as the sky darkened, and the world slowly quieted. A look of disappointment crossed his young face. He stared into my eyes. You mean that's it? <laughs> Till next year, I said. He sat down, turned his face to the sky, and waited. <laughs> Some of his learning was far less noisy. He learned to lie quietly in cafes and on the decks of restaurants, considering patient patrons as they went by and then slowly turning his face to mine, his expression as deadpan as a spy's. You did notice that man with the turkey sandwich, didn't you? I raised my eyebrows. I did notice him. He declined his nose at me. Why don't you get one? I shrugged in agreement. Sounds good to me. So many of our con conversations were conducted in just this way, in silence, gesturing, gesture carrying our meaning. A convention that I employed in his training, in his training, teaching him voice and hand commands simultaneously. Sit, lie down, come, go left, go right, go away, wait. The last, indicated by an uplifted palm, is a very good one for a dog to have in its repertoire. You can employ it if your dog is on a far side of a road and cars suddenly zoom by. If there are a lot of distractions, such as traffic noise people and other dogs, your dog may not hear your voice, but it can see your uplifted palm and that signal meaning, hey, wait right there, may save its life. Finally. Pucka learned the meaning of leave it, although this took a while. Holding him on a leash, I would tempt him with a small salmon nugget set on the ground before him, and when he'd make no move toward it, I'd reward him with a much larger piece of raw elk. Like wait, leave it is also a useful command for a dog to know. For the, do for the command can be extended to unknown trash by the side of the road, to deer and poisonous snakes, and to other dogs. In one case, Pucka's having learned leave it quite possibly saved his life. We were on our way home from a hike on the far side of the Grovant River, and Pucka ran down the bank for a drink while I stood on the single lane bridge gazing at the fast moving current. 
It had been raining and the river was swollen. Suddenly, two otters rose up from the dark water, not five yards in front of Paka, and chirped at him. In the middle of the current, three more otters appeared. The two nearer otters ducked under the surface. The three distant ones called to Paka in their high-pitched cheeps. Without a moment's hesitation, he leapt into the river, for despite his initial dislike of rain, he had become an avid swimmer once I'd introduced him to the comforts of hot springs. <laughs> now there was no keeping him out of the water. Swimming hard, he went after the otters, the brawny current immediately sweeping him downstream. Leave it, I yelled. At the sound of my voice, he glanced up to me, standing on the bridge, but all five otters had risen from the water, only 15 feet in front of him, and were gazing at him while trading glances with each other, as if to say, look at that dog trying to be an otter. Not far downstream lay the Grovant's river-wide hydraulic, a deadly recirculating hole that just a few years before had trapped a father who had dived into its raging white water to save his teenage son. The son had slipped off the narrow spillway while fishing. He survived. His father did not. Again, I shouted, leave it. This time, Pucka held my eyes. But the otters chirped at him once more and purposed, da purposed downstream as if taunting him to chase them. The temptation was too great. He followed. Cupping my hands around my mouth, I bellowed, leave it, filling the command with every bit of authority I possessed and now some terror. Good swimmer though he had become, I didn't think that he could swim out of that ferocious hole fast approaching or that he'd know enough to dive to the bottom of the river's channel and crawl along its rocky bed until he could escape the hydraulic's fateful clutches. There are times when the stentorian approach does work. As my voice thundered over the water, he glanced back at me, and I saw the light go on in his eyes. Oh, it appears that Ted is really serious about this. <laughs> Immediately, he turned toward shore. That's when he realized what a predicament he had gotten himself into. He now had to swim across the current instead of with it, and his eyes started in alarm. Uh-oh, how did the river get so strong? He began to swim with determination, the water occasionally surging over his head, but he didn't fight it. Angling against the current, he ferried himself neatly across the river. But when he reached the shore and tried to land, he was swept away once, twice, three times, until he found an eddy that let him scrabble through the willows and on to the bank. Shaking himself happily, he crashed through the underbrush and in high excitement met me on the bridge. Well done, sir, I cried with passion and no small relief. As he pranced about me, his tail helicoptering with glee, I would have caught them, Ted. I really would have if you hadn't called me. I didn't bother to contradict him. What a good leave it, I said, stroking his shoulders and praising him. It was no time to quibble over the fact that he was supposed to obey the first time he heard the command, not the third. As I petted him, he poked his head through the bridge railings, and his tail increased in tempo. I glanced to where he was looking and saw the five otters porpoising upstream, swimming effortlessly. Reaching the bridge, they stood out of the water and stared at us with their sleek and mischievous faces. It appeared that they had actually returned to see where the playful dog had gone. Otters, I said, now having a moment to name the animals for him. The happiest animals in the world, Pucka. Well, maybe dogs might be as happy. His t he gave his tail an appreciative wag as he stared down at the otters. Not to chase, though. No, no, I intoned. Leave them be. 
his tail slowed, then picked up its pace. As he leaned over the river, ready to take the 12 foot leap, I bet you I could, I put a hand on his shoulders. Pucka, I don't think so. Leave it. As if to reinforce my point, the otters chose that very moment to duck under the surface. Like brown torpedoes, they flashed downstream, arcing out of the river and disappearing beneath it. Just before being swallowed by the breaking rapids, they dove and vanished. Together, Pucka and I watched and waited, waited and watched. Had the otters survived? 10 seconds went by, 15, 20. The otters burst above the surface, nearly back at the bridge, standing upon their tails and chattering at us completely and magnificently at ease. It was like watching a flock of ravens slip and tumble through a tearing wind. Pucka's tail stopped wagging and he gave the otters a long, considering look before turning to me with the same resigned grin he had worn when, as a very young puppy, he had tried to catch ravens walking on our lawn. Flapping their wings, they had easily escaped him. Otters, I said, very good swimmers. <sighs> he gave a soft, resigned pant and a wistful wag of his tail. Well, Maybe I won't catch one. And with that acknowledgement made, he turned and trotted jauntily off the bridge, his tail held high, otters now having joined that growing number of animals whose powers exceeded even those of a first-class dog. Thank you very much for coming out this evening. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And I'm happy that you've got your hand up before I can even say it. So you start. How do you pick a dog with a good personality? Oh, my God. <laughs> um, how, the question is, thank you, how do you pick a dog with a good personality? And that's one of the reasons that I traveled so far around the country looking at parent dogs, because you can somewhat judge what your new dog will be like by the personality of its parents and grandparents. So Pucka's mom is a sweetheart, Pucka's dad is really a sweetheart, his uncle is really friendly and welcoming, his grandfather Drake is a really great home dog even though he's a very athletic dog. So look in person and if you can't do that, ask the breeders, but there's no telling what answer you're going to get on the telephone. Of course, this is the best dog in the world. Be better to go meet them. I don't agree. I think we should go to shelters and save those dogs and give them a good home. That's a very good point. And many people will want to go to shelters, but many other people will want to get a dog whose ancestry they can trace. And I believe that both ends of the spectrum can be served. If we changed how shelters operated, I believe that we could transform those shelters into no-kill ones in not that long of a time. What was said that was that owners need to be better educated about how to handle intact dogs. And if I may offer a few anecdotes about Pucka, 
All the fracases that Pukka has been in, the great majority, have been neutered dogs ganging up on Pukka, not the other way around. And it's been very interesting to witness that because the stereotype is that the dog with its testosterone is going to go in and be the big alpha dog. What I see in dog parks is the exact opposite. It's the neuter dogs ganging up on the intact males. Ted, we have time for one more question, but as you're signing, if people want to make comments. OK. The bookstore wants to go home. And so one more question. Someone who has not asked a question before. Way back there. Great question. The question is, the, what is the availability of alternative birth control methods like vasectomies and tubal ligations, and what is the cost? Unfortunately, the 29 veterinary training colleges in the United States do not teach tubal ligations or vasectomies, even though the procedures have been described in the veterinary literature since 1976. And How's that possible? Uh, it's been, institutions are reluctant to change. They have great inertia. And uh, the reports of, of, if you look at the research, vasectomies and tubal ligations on dogs are reported as being quick, easy, efficient, complications rare. You really have to search out a vet who has trained himself or herself to do those procedures or ask your vet if he or she can learn how to do it. Theoretically, those, the procedures should be cheaper than spaying or neutering because they're less invasive and take less time. A good person uh, on this is Dr. Karen Becker. She writes MercolaHealthyPets.com's web page. She taught herself how to do this. And I think as more people ask their veterinarians to do these procedures, they will become more common. Thank you very much again for coming out this evening. <laughs>